how to design structural steel. Hello and welcome to today's podcast where I'll be talking about the ins and outs of designing structural steel. Now structural steel, as the name suggests, its, its main role is to hold other parts of the building. Uh, they all load bearing. Hardly ever would you come across structural steel that's there just to look nice because to be honest it doesn't really look nice because the surface isn't smooth and and it's a bit like uh, very industrial uh, so predominantly it is used to uh, form the structure of, of the building now structural steel is a very interesting material because on one hand it is an engineering material it, it obviously comes out from the mill it's been rolled and into various shapes and sizes and so on uh, but on the other hand, it's a very crude material. It's almost like bricks where you can create wonderful things, but when you take a brick, it, it normally has some uh, corners chipped, it's not really straight, and, and there are a lot of imperfections. So structural steel needs to be handled in a very specific way. Uh, the general rule of thumb is that the accuracy of a steel structure should be within the tolerance of plus or minus one millimeter. Now in engineering terms, one millimeter is just unacceptable. I mean, imagine having a bearing with one millimeter, one millimeter out, it will fall apart after a few turns. So, so it's just like a completely different level for engineering. Whereas on the other hand, structural steel, these are massive sections, uh, sometimes very complicated shapes like cranks and, and picking up various beams midpoint and then in other places, yet it still needs to be within plus or minus one millimeter. The other thing that adds to the complexity of structural steel is that every steel member is practically a one-off. So unlike, let's say, car manufacturing, where you produce 10,000 of exactly the same piece, here every steel beam is, the, is, is different. Uh, now, even if you have a structure where you have, let's say, 20 columns, which are exactly the same on the drawing, in reality, those beams won't be exactly the same because every steel section has its own uh, tolerances when it comes out from the mill sophisticated operation to actually get structural steel right uh, and in order to actually get it right there are a few rules or principles that one should follow when designing it. The first one I would say is that you should never treat steel as an engineering piece. Uh, sometimes especially when dealing with uh, like when we deal with modular companies uh, they, they, they assume that whatever you draw in your CAD program and then send us the drawings, that is exactly how uh, the steel will end up being. Now that is not true because, uh, well, the sections are different, they, they might have flanges that are skew, a displaced web altogether, uh, so, 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 so it doesn't work that way. Uh, it would have been different if we started from a massive block of steel imagine it's impossible but let's just imagine like 10 meters by 10 meters by 10 meters block of steel and we start milling it down to the desired structure then even though it's not the way forward and people don't do it this way but if we were to do it this way then indeed we would be able to achieve a almost perfect structure which would be down to microns in terms of every single part of uh, of its structure but obviously that is not the way steel is fabricated, not only because of the waste and lifting a cube, which is 10 by 10 by 10 meters, just would have been impossible, let alone having the right machinery to mill it down. Uh, so structural steel is made out of single components, beams and columns. So the next thing that one should look into uh, are the tolerances the tolerances are own, only apply to the critical parts of a beam and predominantly those critical parts are the holes. So you might have holes drilled in a beam or you might have plates welded to the beam that contain holes and those are the critical items. Uh, 
uh, quite often we come across uh, so customers and engineers that expect the beam to have the holes in the right place and that none of the part of the steel beam will be displaced. Uh, and again, that is almost impossible. Even a hollow section, let's say an SHS, which is a square hollow section, on the drawing on, and on, on any CAD software, it's perfectly straight. You take a section, let's say 100 by 100 millimeters and five millimeter wall, you extrude it and in the software it's 100% straight. Whereas in reality it's almost like a banana. Obviously I'm over exaggerating but it's hardly ever straight. So in, in terms of fabricating it we can ensure that the end plates are in the right place, that the holes are in the right place, but then if the ends are critical, that means that the center might move left, right, up, down by a few millimeters. Uh, it becomes trickier when the center part of that kind of beam also is critical because of some holes or there's a plate welded to it. Uh, then there's a bit of more play and quite often it's easier to weld a plate because then we can displace the plate so that the plate is in the right place even though the beam itself is slightly uh, out of its original desired position. The other thing that we've come across quite often is that the assumption that when you weld an end plate to a column, or let's say the base plate, once you weld it and you stand it up on a smooth surface, the column will be 100% vertical in both planes. Now that is almost impossible. Uh, the reasons are firstly because the beam might not be cut straight. Now, that means that our fabricators should pay attention to it. They normally check the squareness of the end. Uh, and if it's not square, if it's like really not square, even like you could see a mitre, you would probably have to trim it down to so straighten it up or just weld the plate that goes uh, on this end uh, slightly at an angle. So actually with the main lines of the beams, it is at right angles. So that is a, let's call it a mistake that can be uh, omitted thanks to sort of the proper fabrication methods. Uh, but then there's another thing that happens. When you weld a plate to a steel section, it naturally bends. Uh, there are ways to mitigate it, like have various shorter welds and wait for it to cool down or you heat the plate and the beam itself up before you weld it and then in a controlled environment you allow it to cool down. So, so there are ways to mitigate it uh, or if, if you like being blunt just use a hammer and just whack it until it's straight uh, again. Uh, so, so there are methods but that all means that either you increase the time and cost of fabricating if you were to heat it up and if you just straighten it up with a hammer, then no matter how hard you try, it will always be imperfect. It will never be perfectly flat. There will always be some, some imperfections. So when you stand up a column with that kind of plate, it will almost never be straight. Uh, and if it is, that's just pure luck. Uh, sort of an exception that just proves the point that it is uh, sort of something that is almost impossible. Uh, Whereas we as a company, we quite often receive inquiries uh, or even instructions that once we weld a very flimsy plate with two small holes for bolts and then we bolt it down to another steel beam, uh, then the expectations are that just by bolting it down, tightening up, the column will be straight and we would have to check the, how vertical it is by using a laser scanner. So, so, so again, from our perspective, when we see these kind of instructions, we just know that it is impossible and is just someone who doesn't have much hands-on experience on structural steel. The other thing that we always pay attention to is making sure that the connections are idiot-proof. What I mean by that is uh, so that it is very, very difficult to make a mistake. Uh, it's something similar to the uh, Japanese pokayoka, where we want the design of the connection to be so simple that it's almost impossible to make a mistake. Now examples of that uh, are plates that are visually not symmetrical. 
The worst that can happen is someone designing a plate which is, let's say, 203 millimeters by 205 millimeters, and the holes uh, there are, let's say, 98 millimeters by 103 millimeters. Now, visually, it would have been almost impossible to spot the difference, and that dramatically increases the chances of making a mistake. And here we would be talking about a 90 degree mistake, which means that basically the plate is welded, rotated by 90 degrees. Uh, and this would be obviously a result of the welder assuming that this is a 100% uh, symmetrical plate and wouldn't bother checking the dimensions. Uh, so we've got a rule of thumb where plates have to be either 100% symmetrical in both planes, and if not, and if there's, if there's a reason for it not to be symmetrical, sometimes you can't because there's a web that needs to be welded between the holes and you need a larger distance between the holes for the washer of the nut uh, to, to fit. Then we have to displace the holes so that you can visually see that they, it's not a symmetrical plate. Now, we often explain to new starters that we want to design steel so that you'd be able to assemble it even when you're drunk. Now, I'm not suggesting anyone drinks at work, uh, but this is basically uh, how we determine how simple it needs to be. And we call it idiot proof. It doesn't mean we employ idiots. Far from it. It's just that we want to make everyone's lives uh, easier. Uh, the other thing that might not be obvious uh, are the working environments of welders or fabricators. Uh, there's one thing sitting behind the desk and drawing the structure, and there's another thing being up in your gear with a mask on, with all the ventilation blowing in your face and thick gloves, uh, sometimes in sweltering heat, and you have to now hold the plate with one hand because it's too small to use a crane for it. Uh, and, and then lining up the lines that they draw to make sure they're all centered, and then tack welding it, and then put it, put it into position. So, so we have to understand that this doesn't come from people being lazy or not paying attention. It's just that these are very harsh work environments, and we have to make it as easy as possible for them. Uh, the other reason is that this forces the designers to make as many connections as possible. So we basically want to standardize connections so that instead of having a hundred different connections in a project with a hundred connections, we'd rather have, let's say, five different connections that are used for those hundred connections. Uh, even if it means over-engineering some connections, that's fine. The cost of having a plate that's three millimeter thicker compared to making a mistake where we have welded the wrong plates by 90 degrees is far more expensive. So so that's why we'd rather have much fewer uh, different connections than, than just going wild and designing whatever the computer throws out. And unfortunately, our experience uh, shows that when we receive drawings from structural engineers that spe specify very weird shaped plates, like the 203 millimeters by 205, that is normally down to their software throwing out these kind of suggestions to the size of the plate. Uh, so, so, so that is another area that we uh, try and focus on. Uh, now, also going back to columns, there is a reason why columns that stand on concrete actually never go onto the existing concrete slab. Uh, based on geometry, when you put a flat surface on an on a uneven surface, and here I'm referring to a flat plate surface to an uneven concrete slab, then it will lay on the first three highest points. That's, that's down to geometry. So when we put a column on an uneven concrete surface, then it will basically be raised on these small particles of sand or some gravel, uh, which is quite dangerous because when we start loading the column by adding the brickwork on top and, and the rest of the structure, then those particles might crush. And even if it's like, five millimeters, it might cause the whole wall above to crack. It's not dangerous, it's, it's, it's still structurally sound, it's just that then you're dealing with a crack and yeah, cracks never look good. So for that reason, the way to mitigate uh, the cracking of those 
stones or particles that are supporting the column and the unevenness of the surface, you normally make columns around 30 millimeters shorter. So you raise them up. This allows you to level everything up and then you use something called a dry pack, uh, which is a dry mixture of cement and sand. Uh, and you basically just stuff the gap uh, up as much as you can. And then that uh, sort of fills out the gap and ensures there's an even transfer of the loading from the column onto the concrete slab. Uh, so, so, so these are the main points. Uh, and like I said, we quite often uh, receive drawings or expectations that are basically impossible. They might look possible on the screen, but in reality, uh, as discussed, structural steel is an interesting material where we end up with one millimeter tolerances, even though the sections aren't perfect. If you have any questions or you'd like to take part in any form of training when it comes to the best rule of thumbs in designing structural steel, then please get in touch. And also remember to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss out on any other future uh, valuable information that we share with you. Thank you.